Paradise Papers. The latest tax evasion data leak are addressing the allegations that they're not contributing their fair share to government coffers. Files reveal that the company has fought off lawsuits and tax bills and has diverted millions of dollars through tax havens. In a report known as 50 Shades of Tax Dodging, the group that represents 48 NGOs claimed Germany and Luxembourg are the worst culprits for offering numerous options for concealing ownership and money laundering. The tax office today has had a big win in its fight against multinational corporate tax dodges. The full bench of the federal court has thrown out an appeal by energy company Chevron, which must now pay the tax office more than $300 million. The government of Tanzania has slapped Acacia Mining with a tax bill of $190 billion. That's equivalent to almost two centuries worth of the gold producer's revenue. The charges relate to alleged underdeclared export revenue from its Bolian Hulu and Buzwagi mines. The tax authority also announced the preliminary assessment of 76.5 billion kwacha issued to a prominent mining company for misclassifying consumables and spare parts at importation for the last five years without identifying the company in question. Zambia has rich deposits of copper and coal, but due to weak demand, prices have fallen to near six-year lows. Mining companies are now looking at restructuring to remain sustainable. Someone to close shop completely following the government's decision to implement a 30% mining tax. The government to say our government to stop giving away these taxes, stop giving away our money and use that money to develop us, give us more roads, schools and hospitals. Welcome to the session on trust and taxes. I'm your host, Osa Boshean. I'm from an organization called Raw Talks. And if you haven't heard of Raw Talks, in short, we interview brilliant people, thinkers in the area of natural resources and development, and we share their videos, their knowledge in videos online. And in that spirit, the session is also being filmed. Today we explore a very important and perhaps a bit contentious topic, trust and taxes. And my role is to ask the relevant question to our eminent panel. And with further ado, let me introduce you to them. We have Elevin de Congera, Extractive, Extractive Industries Coordinator in Oxfam in Malawi, Ignatius Mula, Assistant Director in Zambia Revenue Authority and member of the UN Subcommittee on Extractive Industries Issues for Developing Countries, and last but not least, John Condon, Senior Vice President Tax and Treasury at Barrick Gold. Also, you've been with BP for a very long time. We can add that. Okay. Before we start, let me just explain quickly the rules of the game. We've divided the discussion into three sections. We already saw one clip and we will share two more from Raw Talks interviews. And this will be used to instigate discussion throughout. We also have crowdsourced uh, some questions from our social media audience. So some questions came in via Twitter. And we only have one hour to get through all of this, so I think we better get started. Let's turn to the panel. First section of the discussion is trust and mining taxation. Elevin, the clip touched on a number of recent tax controversies from the Panama Papers to more specific mining issues. In your view, is the issue of trust and taxation different in mining than in other sectors? Yes, thank you, Ansa, for the question. And, um, Thanks for the opportunity for me and to speak on this panel. Uh, I would say that there are quite a number of uniqueness in the mining sector. First of all, we have to look at that the mining sector, it's one of the sectors that is seen as a major sector in most developing countries. And hence, it raises a lot of expectations. And uh, most of you would agree with me that most developing countries, when they find out that they have a mineral reserve, they see money flowing into the economy. So that's the expectation from the government, expectation from the people, from the citizens and every, everyone. And secondly, the uniqueness of the mining sector is that it has a significant adverse impact, mostly on the environment and also on the expectations. For example, if you're looking at uranium mining, when the mine is coming on uranium, people have lots of worries around the environment and everything. And uh, also to look at it further, the mining sector is one of the sectors whereby you look at an unrenewable resource. So when you're negotiating a contract, you have to get it right and get it right. If you get it wrong, it's a complete mess. 
it's unlike the other sectors. And it's because we are dealing with an unrenewable resource that is extracted. And uh, further to that, the mining sector, we've seen that it's one of the sectors which uh, the project-to-project -project negotiations actually dominates. Therefore, this uh, sometimes gives room for corruption, and also it in a way promotes inequality. So it's also, I would also say that it's also one of the sectors whereby you have had quite limited participation for the civil society. And hence, with this background, it's, this brings the uniqueness of the sector, and that's why we have a lot of trust issues around the mining sector. Thank Thanks you. difficult question. Do mining companies actively try to minimize the tax that they pay in a given country? Thanks, Osa. Um, look, look, I think um, the reality is that um, companies' uh, uh, tax is an outcome of business activity. So um, it depends on the cycle or stage of the particular investment, or the mine, where it's at, the level of capital investment required. Uh, the use of technology and other things, um, and obviously commodity prices, uh, and the and the extent that we're able to produce to to our plans. So I think um, you know the focus of the business is on the production and trying to be more efficient and trying to grow margin, uh, and tax is an outcome of of that. Ignatius, what about governments? Do they create mistrust between them and maybe the citizens um, and that stakeholder relations? What do you say? I think uh, I think the, the the issue of, uh, of of trust between government, the business, and, and the general public, especially in most uh, developing countries, is real, and uh, there's there's a lot of mistrust. Uh, as uh, Evelyn mentioned, in any country where there is natural resource, there's a high expectation by the citizens that there'll be a lot of revenue contribution coming from the sector. Now the the, the, the trust breaks down in that uh, the public, in most, in most countries you find that the mining institutions are run by private uh, investors and not the government. So they, 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 they don't trust those people. Then again, the public in most instances, they won't trust the regulatory agencies. They might not trust the regulator in terms of the tax authority, the, the mining department, in terms of having the appropriate capacity to monitor the, the mining companies. And therefore, that, that brings in mistrust. Or they may think the government has the information which they are not giving out to the public, and therefore that creates mistrust. So the, the, that high expectation, the fact that the, 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 the companies are run by private investors brings a lot of, of, of mistrust. Again, from, from the other angle of the government, it, from the government, you've got the tax authorities, you've got the, 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 the mining departments and, and several other people. You need to have a balance of, in terms, if you have to, to develop trust in terms of encouraging, uh, developing the trust, how transparent can you go? Because you also need to be mindful of confidentiality because certain information you get, like a tax authority, is kept confidential and the certain information you can give out in the public. So how do you manage that to ensure that that mistrust that is, you, that might be created indirectly by activities is stopped. But would you say, in general, that um, trust has broken down between the actors in the market? Yes, in general, especially I think in, in in most developing countries, trust has broken down, and that's why you think you you find that uh, mining is a very topical issue. Uh, people trying to benchmark, people trying to. I mean, if you see even internationally, we're we're having a lot of topical issues on on mining, two kits for mining. So it means there's, there's, there's this lack of trust. So essentially, I would say trust has broken down. Um, John, do you agree that trust has broken down between the actors in the sector? So yes, I think I, I, trust has broken down. It's an issue across the, across the, the developing world. I think um, we have a very public dispute, our subsidiary Acacia with um, the government of Tanzania. Uh, First Quantum have a very public dispute in uh, in Zambia. Um, Glencore and others have, have been um, publicly reported as having significant disputes. These are really troubling, uh, not just the fact that um, the size of the disputes that uh, uh, were involved here, but the fact that they're taking forever to, to resolve and, and, and uh, reach resolution. So I think there is a real issue there, and we need to think about um, how we've approached engagement on both sides in the past, and how do we how do we move forward and learn from that experience? I think um, 
one of the real difficulties is that um, when communities feel that uh, they're not benefit benefiting from the mining activity, um, it's easy for governments to uh, look at the mining companies as targets and to, and to blame poor be or bad behaviour and, and tax avoidance. So we see headlines about companies siphoning money offshore through aggressive tax planning, um, and these are very in inflammatory. And I think the reality from my conversations and the discussions that I have through the industry bodies and other companies is that often the, um, the rhetoric doesn't match the, the facts in terms of audit findings and there's a, there's a high degree of frustration around that. So I think there's an onus uh, for us to recognise that at the end of the day what's at the heart of the issue is, is how the community feels because governments react to how communities feel. And we need to do, both the industry and governments need to do more to demonstrate the benefits of mining and the benefits that have, have seen real progress in critical areas like poverty, uh, education, health. Um, ICMM uh, have just done a research paper, it's available on their website, and it shows progress in 11 critical areas over the last uh, 15 years as a result, partly as a result of mining activities. And I think it's really, it, was, uh, it was really refreshing to actually read it. I, and I, you don't see these things written very often, but I th I'd encourage everybody to read it. And um, it also highlights where you know, significant improvement is still required in the developing world around creating a peaceful environment creating a just environment, creating strong institutions. These are really, really important to de deliver confidence and to enable companies to invest in the future and feel that um, um, you know, the environment they're, they're stepping into is, is one that they understand. And the element, civil society typically companies or governments. Is it because you don't see the benefits like John alluded to? It's true that uh, civil society might have some doubts with government and also with companies and this all comes in because of uh, lack of access to information or secrecy of which uh, Ignatius called it as the confidenti confidentiality clauses to us we question that to what extent uh, are we going to go with the confidentiality issues? Because for the few instances that the civil society have accessed information, they have done justice to the information, they have brought out issues that were quite critical for, critical for national development. For example, this morning Margaret mentioned about Paladin in Malawi, a company in Malawi which, was, uh, which did tax shop, is it, treaty shopping. Uh, where it was sending money from Malawi to Netherlands, taking advantage of the treaty, and then from Netherlands to Australia. So all along we lost Malawi in a period of six years, lost about 43 million US dollars. So this report actually came from civil society action aid and represented to government, and that wa that's what raised the alarm to the government. That was the first instance. And secondly, I, even as Oxfam, we have also done an analysis of the oil and gas contracts, which previously were secret, but when we accessed them, when they were made public documents, we analyzed them, and we actually saw that there were quite a number of shortfalls in the contracts. And after presenting to government, they said, no, we needed to know this yesterday. So as civil society, we have, or we have taken a major steps in trying to bring, I mean, to prove that uh, transparency and accountability is quite key and it can help to shape the sector. And maybe just to mention that we as civil society, what we want is to promote sustainable development. Unfortunately, in the mining sector, most of the civil societies have been labeled as anti-mining or anti-development. But looking at the trend of civil society at present, we are for development and we are for sustainable development, a development that is going to bring justice. So one thing that I would call for before I stop talking now is that trust civil society and this is what is going to help to improve the trust from the communities and we all work, work for this common goal. Thank you. From online um, is whether governments can build trust both with companies and with their own public, or is there a conflict by building trust with companies? Do governments risk losing trust with citizens? That's a very good question. Yes, uh, my my answer would be yes. Governments, I think, have a, have a, have a large role in, in 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 building trust. So how how can governments build trust? Uh, firstly, if you have an appropriate tax administration, uh, 
well, well resourced, um, competent staff, if they need to have, uh, let, let's say if it's mining, they need to be resourced with people with a mining background, people who know the tax laws, people are good at analytics, people who understand the sector. So you, 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 and you give them the resources that they need, access to the right databases, to do the right analysis. That's one part that you deal with. There's, there are certain things which have been uh, promulgated over the years. Uh, does the country have the EITI, Extractive Industry Transparency Initiatives, which has an independent person saying, this is a, what the government reported has been paid. This is what the mining companies report has been paid. If you have such an avenue, and that largely depends on the, on the government. Again, how do they engage with the mining companies? Do they engage the mining companies, maybe through the, 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 the mining chamber there? And what kind of information can the chamber be producing to, to the citizenry? The, like uh, John mentioned, if a mining company is, is doing certain con uh, um, infrastructure development, be it, be it schools, be it uh, the, the various corporate social responsibilities that they are doing, how do you disseminate that? That is what you are doing. If you are providing any training, to locals, enhance, changing the livelihoods of the locals. How do you ensure that that comes out to the public? How do you have frequent forums with civil society? Like she's saying, the trust issue is just not with mining companies, but it's also with civil society. So <laughs> how do you deal with, with, that, with that trust issue? And the other thing is having a way of uh, collaborating with mining companies, like giving, uh, giving information to the government on their plans for maybe quarterly, having those meetings. So a mining company will know if they've received additional uh, investment approval to, to expand in a mining company. Or if they see that they are, for them to increase their lifespan, there are certain things they need to do. If that information is given upfront to the government, it also helps because if the government wants has done their budget and they're saying from, from mineral contribution in this year we'll get so much without knowing that maybe three of the mining companies actually their production coming the next three years will, will go down. And if that money is now not coming up, it brings in suspicions. So then there's need for more collaboration. So to, to put it simply, the government yes has a big role in, in ensuring that trust is, is, re, is rebuilt. Um, because we're moving on to, to, to more of the solutions to this, but how much do you think the characteristics of the mining sector play a role in mistrust? It's a complex industry. We have cyclicality, difficulties to manage both from government and company sides. It's a really good question. Um, obviously, BEPS has uh, been a headline and a real concern for all of us um, uh, for the last five years, and we've seen... Um, you know, governments respond appropriately, and uh, I think uh, one of the things that's worth bearing in mind is that in our sector, in the mining sector, um, it's pretty evident where our economic activity is, um, and I think we, we, we ought to bear that in mind. I, I, I think the um, reality is, is that um, where you've got, you know, a large uh, uh, project uh, that has significant infrastructure, significant capital investment required on an ongoing basis, um, it's, it's very difficult to um, sometimes forecast and predict exactly how projects will play out. And I think um, uh, when we get into sort of talking about how do we address this going forward, it, it starts to bring in the, the need in our sector with our discussions with government um, around tax policy is to understand risk and how do we, how do we factor risk into tax policy for projects. Not all projects have the same risk. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, we want a fiscal system, an agreement with the government where, that um, reflects an appropriate sharing of that risk. Moving to, to more of the moving forward part of, of this and to get us in the mood, here is a Raw Talks Clips with Marcus Courage, CEO of Africa Practice. You frequently talk to investors. What are they looking for? in African countries? common requirement for investors is predictability. So they want a sound and stable policy environment. And that has not changed after the super cycle? No, that hasn't changed. Um, by and large, investors are prepared to accept um, deficiencies in the model, the policy framework, providing they have some assurances over the predictability, the stability of that, of that regulatory environment. 
Rebuilding trust, next section. John, I'm going to start with you. Compliance with existing regulations and agreements has to be the starting point for companies. But if legislation is not equitable, does the company have a responsibility to question the deal? Is there a business case maybe even to do that to avoid conflicts further down the road? Yes, uh, th there is an obligation. And I think, um, I think companies um, know if, if um, concessions being offered are too generous, um, they will discount those away in the, in the economics. They're not going to factor those in over the life of a, a long-term project. Um, clearly, you know, that's a feature of our, our industry. Our projects are long-term, 20, 30 years or more. Um, so concessions need to be realistic and I think, um, uh, I would hope and expect most companies that when they're sitting down with governments to talk about fiscal terms that there's an appropriate, um, you know, balance in discussions to make sure that, you know, concessions that are too generous just don't get, get, don't, don't get part of the final deal. I think what's most important, I touched on it before, was that um, when discussions around fiscal terms for a project are, are being had at the outset, that there's an, there's an appropriate recognition of risk and risk sharing for the project. So if you've got a really, really challenging project, but the government and the country and the, and the company want the investment, um, then the fiscal terms need to reflect that greater risk. And so if you have fiscal terms where a government is collecting revenue earlier on in the project uh, before costs are recovered, then the government's saying, I don't really want to take too much risk. Yeah, I, want the, I want the company to take the risk. Um, whereas if the government recognise that, A, we really need this investment, but this is the features of this project are riskier than other projects that the group can invest in, um, we need to encourage the investment, then the fiscal terms will be rebalanced or should be rebalanced so that um, much of the cost can be recovered before more tax is being paid. And so this is an example of the difference between production taxes on, on revenue early and income taxes on profit where costs are generally recovered and having that later. So I think it, it, it inevitably there's a balance that's got to be struck uh, that's relevant and appropriate for the particular project. Uh, a balance between a mix of taxes where the government can see some revenue coming in early without um, uh, causing the project economics to be um, uh, adverse, too adverse. Um, but on the other hand, there's an appropriate balance for profit-based taxes, income tax, so that the company can recover a large part of its cost before it has to start paying tax. And if, it, if you can get that balance right, then you've got a fiscal pact with the government that's appropriate for the project. And hopefully, you know, if those discussions are done in good faith, um, then, um, you know, you've got more chance of predictability and stability in the future. Um, but of course, things can change and, and, and circumstances can change. And, you know, what we thought might have been a big risk may not have become such a risk. Um, and so equally, the mature discussions should be had at the outset about what are the param parameters for us to get back around the table and talk about terms where um, either risks have become greater than we thought or not as much as we thought and how do we rebalance and how do we work together and, and, and maybe it's a discussion every five years to, to think about the terms um, but in a way that's predictable, what, uh, that's factored into the early discussions and I think, um, you know, hopefully that's the way of the future. thinking around balance. Do you think of balance in the same way? That's a, 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 a difficult uh, question, but I would say, yes, a balance is, is needed, because at the end of the day, from a country perspective, you want continued investment, and you want revenue contribution. Uh, if you kill investment, going forward, you won't have any revenue contribution coming because there will be no one contributing. So you, you need that balance. But now the question is, from the government perspective, when you have that investment, at what point do you expect the revenue to start coming in? I think that's, that's the biggest question. Are you patient to wait for 10 years? Or do you want it to come within three years or five years? I think to me that's, that's the key issue of where you find the balance sometimes is difficult to find. And again, it's a type of commodity. If I'm dealing with nickel, I'm dealing with cobalt, I'm dealing with copper, the, the, the term, in terms of the price volatility, it might not be, always be the same. So, and, and the particular investment needed for coal and the like differs. So uh, at the end of the day is, is to come up with probably a regime that 
from a government perspective with a lot of uh, pressing needs, maybe you come up with a regime that still gives you something in the initial stages, then later on you have maybe uh, a regime that when there's higher profits, it gives you more. So it's, it responds to the, the profit levels. So yes, the balance is needed, but now the question is, between the investor and the government, what timing in terms of the contribution? Are, are, are governments willing to wait for five years or for 10 years? And sometimes those are the things that bring in mistrust. You can agree that uh, with the investor, look, this is a regime that we shall have. It may be stable for, for five years. The company puts in so much investments. So going forward, they have a lot of capital deductions and they've got a lot of tax losses. Three years down the line, you find maybe the commodity price has just gone tenfold up. Then the citizens are not seeing any revenue coming in. So that, that now creates more political pressure on the government from the communities. So that's what I'm saying. It's, 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 it's difficult because there are other players who are not part of what you've agreed with the company. But then when they start looking at the price which has gone tenfold, there's nothing coming in. And that's why, from my point of view, having, for instance, like the mineral royalty, from where it go, it gives you something. Then the corporate income tax can start giving you more as the company makes more returns. Yeah. Civil society and, and expectations, may, maybe an understanding of how how the sector works. Is that an important step, you think? Yes, it's... Um, okay, before I respond to your question, I still wanted to quickly react to the balance topic. Uh, the balance would be... Would, it's a good approach, it's a good way to go. Unfortunately, because of the trust issues, it also raises a lot of questions. For example, I've seen quite a number of mines in, develop, in the developing countries, whereby maybe they have been given some exemptions for the first five years or ten years just for them to stabilize. But then three years into the operation or five years, when you're now ready to start collecting what you wanted to collect, they go under care and maintenance, so maybe they go into, they're no longer operational. So it we really have to prove it if we want to overcome the if we want to overcome the balance issue so yeah you can ask the other question uh, how important is it for civil society to to understand uh, the industry oh yeah actually it is very key for the civil society to understand the industry especially when now you come to when you come to managing expectations, it is very crucial that the civil society should understand because it's mostly the civil society that have a closer contact or closer touch with the citizens and uh, with the yeah with the public. So, moving forward, I think we need quite more engagements between the government, the private sector, and the civil society so that we all take a common message to the communities. We prepare or we manage the expectations. So that is quite crucial. John, what are you? Ways from from what Barrick has gone through in the past years. Being at Barrick a short time, I joined in February. Uh, but um, uh, I think um, I, I think what I can say is that the company is uh, uh, working very hard to build relationships and move to um, a partnership culture. So uh, we've spent um, a lot of time um, in the last six months trying to you know, peel the onion back on the definition of partnership and understand what that really means and how do we, how do we go forward uh, and work with governments in a different way. So, um, you know, we've, the company has stepped in to um, help Acacia uh, resolve the, the dispute in, in, Tanz in Tanzania with the government. Um, we're hopeful that uh, we can re rebuild trust uh, with the government uh, there and be able to put a, uh, a proposal to the independent board of Acacia um, uh, at some point, uh, we're not there yet, but we're hopeful that through this approach of partnering and working together and trying to educate the government on how the company does life of mine economics and how we can share in the benefits of that over the life of the mine, regardless of the volatilities that, that can occur without solely relying on, on rigid, rigid taxes, is a really important component. I think, you know, we're learning. It's very difficult to bridge and educate um, government uh, that aren't experts in, in, in mining and I think we, we recognise that this is taking time but I think transparency is at the heart of uh, rebuilding the trust and um, making sure that as a company, Acacia in the future in that example, um, um, we'll be able to be transparent and clear around performance and, and how can we give the government confidence that that will be the case. So 
So I, I think what, we're, what I'm saying is that um, um, the lesson for Barrick is that um, we have a lot of work to do uh, to resolve the back years, uh, open years in the past, and it's a, it's a key priority for us to do that. But what we're trying to do is resolve those years, but at the same time resolve a way of working together for the future. So, you know, we, we, we're very hopeful that the, the relationships and trust that we, we, we hope that we're building with, with the government, not just in Tanzania but in other places, that holds us in good stead that we can minimise the, the sorts of issues and disputes that we've had in the past in the future. So in-house, within the company, you're mostly looking at transparency. Yeah. Or are you changing other practices around fiscal regimes? Mm -hmm. I think the big message that um, our, our chairman, John Thornton, is giving to his staff is, is um, personal ownership and, um, and buying into the partnership culture and what it really means um, and trying to recognise that our success is not just our success, it's the success of governments and communities and how do we work together. And, um, you, know, um, you know, there's commentators that uh, will suggest that, you know, this is um, you know, a different and perhaps an unwise way to, way to go forward. You know, um, Barrick has a high effective tax rate. You know, 49% is our forecast effective tax rate for this year, uh, much higher than industry standard. And uh, that reflects some agreements that we have with governments in countries where we've got tier one mines. And we're not, we don't shy away from that. We, 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 we obviously want to pay the right amount of tax. But we, more, more important for us is our success, is, is if we can deliver on the partnership culture and make sure that um, um, you know, we, we, we have strong relationships with governments that allow us to continue to invest uh, with some predictability. And, and so um, it's important for us not to look in the rearview mirror too much. It's important to stay positive and try to work and build relationships for the future. Ignatius, partnership culture. How does that sound to you? I mean, the partnership culture to me, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a welcome thing and it's something that I have seen personally, where especially if you deal with um, um, green, uh, green investments where you, you, it, there's a mine, what you found is a bush. So you find that for you to now, for the, for the mining company as they invest there, they'll have a lot of partnership with the communities. You'll find that they, 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 they will, they will bring in infrastructure development, they will employ staff from within the villages, they will train them. So that, that partnership culture starts from where they are operating from. Uh, what kind of supplies can they source, source locally? All that creates the partnership. But then it, it has to go further on now to the regulators. What kind of partnership can you create, for instance, with the revenue authority? Do you borrow in from the, the concepts of cooperative compliance and enhanced relationship in terms of dealing with the mining companies? What kind of reporting and meetings do they have with the mining department? I think that's important for collaboration, for knowing what's happening, for monitoring production and costs, just knowing how the business is moving. And also for the mining company, having a few of how government is, is looking at things and how what government expects so that if there's any expectation gap, that partnership can try to bridge the expectation gaps. Yeah. And Evelyn, what role would you like to see the side play in a partnership? Okay, um, I think it will be very good if civil society can be given a chance to participate in this and specifically by making, by the government increasing transparency and also the companies opening up to civil society as well as the government. Um, I say this because if we focus more on transparency, it's the same thing as if you're, let me speak as an African woman, <laughs> if you're married and then your husband has a salary, the first step is to know how much he gets, and the second step is to know how he spends that money. Because... <laughs> <laughs> Knowing, just knowing how much he gets, it's not enough. You have to know actually how it's spent because is it for the interest of the family or it's for his personal interest? <laughs> Thanks for that. So how do I link it to this discussion? It's the <laughs> Thank you. It's the same thing with uh, 
with mining, for us to rebuild trust in mining, first step is to comply to EITI. The government declares how much is paying to the companies, and the companies are also declaring how much they're paying to government. And after us as citizens knowing that, now we want to take now our husband, who is the government, further that how are they spending that money? How are we sharing the revenues and everything? So how much is coming direct to the, direct to the communities? That actually helps for you to improve trust so I think as civil society and also as all the stakeholders, we should take proactive action in making transparency key and also being, uh, being ready for accountability. Yeah, let me end it there. I hardly know where to go from there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Kathy, we're going to move into the, the final section. Uh, so one more clip, a short clip with Ken Haddock. You have mentioned something that you would like to see, and that is something, uh, a relationship driven by goals. So goal-based management instead of terms-based management between host governments and resource developers. What do you mean by that? Both parties to uh, a, an agreement such as a mineral development agreement need to consider what are each party's goals. Return on investment and security of tenure and management of risk are absolutely vital on the investor side. On the government side, it's vitally important for the benefits to be perceived to the nation, to be felt to the nation. And so each party needs to uh, frame its position, understanding the others. And that's why I think the West Australian case that I give is, is one where both parties had different points of view, but they understood the others. And the, the goals were mutually understood and recognised. Uh, in a developing country situation, the, the goals of the nation may be more uh, complex and expansive than, say, in Australia, but the, it is the responsibility of the mining company to understand and incorporate those in the position it takes in discussing mining agreements. And with that, our session is up. Thank you so much for joining Rotox. Well, thank you for having me. And to keep up with the new debate on extractive sand development, join us on rotox.org. Well, it's not up just yet. <laughs> we have 10 more minutes and we have the entire future of mining taxation to go through. Uh, Ignatius, it's your turn to, to start this. Is the current approach fit for a world where we know um, what we are dealing with in terms of tax avoidance? What would you see as the natural evolution of the mining tax system? Very simple question. <laughs> I hope so. Um, in in, in my, my personal view, I think the, the, the current approach to me is still fit for purpose. Uh, when I say the current approach, where you have fiscal instruments, like from the mining perspective, you have your mineral royalties and you have your, your corporate income tax system. To me, I think that that approach is still fit for purpose. But what is key is how you structure that corporate income tax and how you structure your, your mineral road system. Uh, for instance, your income, uh, the corporate income tax system, how do you structure things to do with ring fencing? What kind of ring fencing rules do you bring in? Uh, what kind of capital expenditure deduction do you put in? Do, and what do you cover in that? What kind of assets do you put on accelerated depreciation? What, and those which you don't put on accelerated depreciation? What kind of tax loss periods do you, do you put in? So to me, that's what matters. And also, what is the appropriate tax rate? And should it be a variable rate, such that a mining company has got more profits, then the rate goes up? So to me, I think the, the, the corporate income tax rate, I think, is still good. And again, it takes into account the risk and return of the investment. Then the, the mineral road is there because you have to deal with the, the, the public issues and the, also the political issues. People are seeing the resources coming out of, of the ground, and those resources won't be replaced. So the mineral road it acts as a compensation for that. And again, the mineral road the way it works, like in our country, it works like on what I can say on a turnover system. It's, 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 it's on your cells. So 
whether a mining company has got a tax loss or not, that mineral royalty contribution will, will come in. So again, it's also how you, 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 you structure it. Do you structure the mineral royalty on a net basis where you look at uh, EBITDA or profits, or do you capture it on, on sales basis and you, you remove the treatment costs? Or do you do it the way we do in Zambia, where for certain minerals we just look at the LME price or the price on the metal bullet in terms of quantity that you sold and we apply the rate? So to me, the mineral royalty and the, and the income tax, I think they are still fit purpose, but what matters is how they are designed. So in terms of going forward, going forward, I think th there's uh, advancement in technology. There's, uh, there's so much from the BEPS output. I think going forward is more the capacities in terms of how do you collect information? How do you collect information? Because there's more digital information, there's more requirements for exchange of information, and there's a lot of information that you can access. So how do you make synergies in accessing that information that can help you analyze the tax risk, analyze your mining sector. So there'll be need to having a, appropriate systems of how you collect information from the mining sector, from third parties, from uh, databases that are there, and how you now use your information maybe proactively in knowing where the company is, is going. Yeah. been struggling to find sort of the right level of taxation, um, which has cost friction. What lessons would you like to take with you in moving into the future in terms of the relationship with, with the companies and the citizens? I think, like, for Zambia, I think from 2008, I think we've had a, a number of, um, of, of uh, changes in terms of the fiscal regime. But there are certain things that have, have remained constant. For instance, in terms of the minority, the norm value concept where we use a reference price, that tax base has remained constant for the past 10 years. What has just been changing is, is the tax rate. When you look at how we deal with hedging, because the, the hedging was taken as a risk and there's no capacity to deal with hedging. Even if it's a risk as management too for, for the commodity industry, that was taken separately to be dealt with separately and that has remained constant. The capital deduction was changed and I think for the past four years that has, hasn't been changed. But the other things that we've learned going forward to ensure that we, we are more proactive and we, we, we deal with the mistrust, we recently, government recently launched what we call the Mineral Value Chain Monitoring Project, where we have uh, uh, various agencies involved, the key stakeholders, the Ministry of Mines, the Road Development Agents, the Bureau of Standards, the Zambia Revenue Authority, where we monitor production electronically from exploration up to export. So the mining companies, when the truck is leaving with a shipment, when they, when they wait, that information comes to the system. They also, the mining companies submit electronically the, the commodities they, 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 they imported, the commodities they mined, what they processed, what they sold. And all the key stakeholders can access that information. So we have no duplication on information, and it, it is increasing transparency, and we are, we are able to monitor what is happening, and we have our staff there. So those are some of the lessons we've learned on how do we reduce this friction and increase trust. Yeah. How would you like the partnership between civil society, government, and companies look like? Um, I think, uh, first of all, as I said, we need to work together. We need to recognize each player as an important player in ensuring sustainable development, and especially in the extractive sector. That's one key. So that calls for open collaboration. And secondly, uh, I think moving forward, we'd like to see more of the initiatives from the private sector in responsible tax. For example, the approach that the B team is taking, it's one of the commentable examples that we can take moving forward in order to improve the trust issues in the sector. And further to this, I think we also really have to look at the fair sharing of resources. Of course, this, is the this has to be led by the government, but supported by the private sector as well as the civil society. Um, if we lead this approach of the fair sharing of resources, it's going to help to rebuild the trust in the sector. John, looking into the future, what do you identify as the risks moving forward? And is there a way of um, preempt uh, future trust issues? I think that's a really good question. I think we've got to learn from the past. Uh, I think um, I think we need to see a, a, a shift generally from governments taking a, 
a, uh, a rights-based approach, so it's my right to tax you, and this is what I'm going to tax you, and uh, move to an interest-based approach where they set tax policies that are in the interests of the com in the interests of the uh, the country. Um, I, uh, so I think that's really important. I think we need to see a, a, a move from how policies have been developed in the past to to um, to how we set it going forward and work in collaboration. I think that's a key thing. If we don't, if we don't, so if we don't see that, let me just be really clear. Um, then we'll we'll have rising inequality. So um, I know governments in Africa, developing world, probably don't don't recognise this now or, or believe it. But the reality of multinational investment is capital is scarce and allocating capital is a rigorous process and ultimately only the most competitive projects will get capital and I think one should be mindful of what's happening in the developed world so look at what's happened in the US last year that's a real stake in the ground by the US government if the reform sticks that's a mark sense of competitive tension that they're deliberately creating the UK as well the UK wants to play the moral high ground and be a leader on BEPS, but you only have to look at their policy to realise they know all too well the importance of a competitive tax system. Okay, so there are big changes happening in the developing world to encourage capital investment to those countries. So if the developing world doesn't understand that, my concern is that there will be rising inequality because the investment will go elsewhere. Ignatius, I want to let you answer that one. Do you have any comments? Definitely, I think from what John is saying, if a company has to make a decision of, of, of where their, their capital will go, and if they think where the, the, the tax regime is more competitive, definitely, I mean, from the, the, the point of the investor, that will happen. From the government point of view, I think it becomes tricky. At one po at one angle, governments have been in the past trying to attract investment. I mean, look even at Zambia. When we signed the development agreements, we, are very, we had very generous incentives to attract investment. Our mineral road rate was 0.6 percent, all in a bid to attract that, that capital. But then with time, you get a backlash that you're, you're not getting anything. You need to have higher rates. So now it's a question of, from a government's point of view, how do they make that balance of they still attract the investment, but they still get the right contribution? From the investor's point of view, obviously, they will look at where is it more generous for us. I mean, where is it, uh, where do we have the less tax bill to invest? So <laughs> it's, it's these two words which for a government becomes, again, difficult. Because they've got various competing means. They want the investment, but they want the revenue contribution. So to have that balance from the government perspective, yes, it, it, be, it becomes difficult. But from the investor, it's quite easy for them maybe to just to move their capital. One hour passes by so fast. Um, we are uh, approaching four o'clock. Um, I want to give the panel a chance for final remarks, if any final comments. Um, Elevin, start with you. Trust stays in the minds of the people, so I still want to emphasize on the component of transparency. Let us, by all means, I mean, let us by all means uh, commit to transparency, and this should be a, a self-driven initiative by the private sector, by the company, by the government, and also by the civil society. And we all have a common goal, and that is to promote sustainable development of our countries. And if we do it right, we do it well. Thank you. So I agree with that. Um, I would say um, so. Act act like partners is key. Um, I think uh, we, uh, know the business better is really important. Um, strive for predictability and sharing of economic benefits of mining, and collaborate. So engage, work together, look for the industry to come up with the solutions and ideas for how the fiscal framework can change to meet changing circumstances. But work together. My two colleagues, we need sustainable development. We need to work together with the industry, and I think that it's also key that the, from the regulating agencies, it's always important that governments have the right uh, skill in terms of staff. People understand the industry, and also come up with mechanisms, all the stakeholders, civil society, private sector, government, on how we can ensure that this trust 
that we develop trust, so that means trust goes, because I think once you develop trust, things become predictable, you have less changes in regime changes, you have, you're able to deal with the expectations, and people to realize that most of the commodities, they are price takers. And how does, how, how does that impact a price take? I think th there's need for that. But capacity building, sharing information, having such discussions, I think, will help m moving forward. Thank you very much for engaging in this topic and this session, and thank you, IGF.